Adam Surrey is a man who appreciates a bit of peace and quiet in life. He's a small business owner and in 2012, he decided that he could quite happily work from home and avoid the hurly-burly of office life. It meant he got to spend more time with his wife, but he found being at home was anything but free from disturbance. I found then I was more aware of people who knocked on the door trying to sell things and more aware of the number of cold telephone calls that we received. Like many of us, he felt there was little he could do to stop the calls. He believed his telephone number must have been sold onto one or more sales companies who were free to disturb him at will. It felt like somebody coming along just kind of doing this all the time, which isn't kind of an acceptable kind of lifestyle thing to do. And in fact, talking to family and friends, I hear that about half the people I speak to, they don't answer their landline anymore. They either leave it to go to answering machine or don't answer it at all, which is, it's a real abuse that we can't have a landline to be able to talk to people. One day he received a call about PPI, Payment Protection Insurance, from a company he suspected had rung him before. Richard decided to play along with the call and pretend he was interested just to get more information about the company. So while talking with them and pretending to be that I could be a customer with them, I had to carry on until they gave me their company name and I could look it up on the internet and I said, oh yes, I can see your address here is XYZ and they said, yes, that's right. So I knew who I was dealing with. Richard had all the information he needed, so he dropped the pretense that he was interested and hit them with an ultimatum. I said to them, if you call me again, I'll charge you £10 per minute for my time. It wasn't the response the company was used to getting, but Richard hoped his tactic would be enough to make sure they never rang back. Some chance. To my astonishment, two days later on the 20th, the phone rang again with similar kind of acoustic, similar kind of script and carried on with it to try to find out who they actually were and it turned out to be the same organisation again. When obviously it wasn't a customer for them, they hang up on me, but I called them back. I said to them, I need to, you need to be clear, you don't call me again, because if you call me again, I'm going to charge you again. You need to get this right and not call me. Richard felt he'd made it perfectly clear he intended to charge the company and now they'd called a second time, he made good on his threat. Then I invoiced them for 19 and a half minutes at £10 a minute, so I sent them an invoice for £195. Richard didn't get a response to his invoice, but he had no intention of letting the company off the hook. So after 30 days, I hadn't heard anything from them, so I sent them a recorded delivery letter to their registered office, reminding them that they had this unpaid invoice. The PPI company had invoiced was quickly realising they had picked the wrong man to cold call. It's good in this kind of case to show a relentlessness to somebody. So in the first letter, I, uh, an invoice, I said it want payment after 30 days, and bang on the 30 days, I write the second letter because it shows I'm awake and paying attention. And then in saying to them that with, if I didn't hear from them in 11 days, I'd raise the, raise the small claims court. Richard did finally get a response from the sales company to his threats of court action, but it wasn't what he was expecting. They sent a letter flatly denying that they'd ever called him, but that didn't bother Richard at all. Unbeknownst to the company, he had a secret weapon. So receiving that letter actually, I think, amused me more than anything else because I record every phone call that I make or receive at home, as we do at work, and so I had the recordings of all these calls, and in the recordings, it's got my name and their name, so it's very clear what's gone on. There is a good reason Richard was able to record calls so quickly and easily. It's been his line of work for over 20 years. One way of recording calls is with something like this, which can either sit into the computer, as you can see here, or it can be used externally. Fit it into the computer and you just plug your telephone line into it and record calls straight onto the PC. This is the actual recording of the phone call that Richard made. Richard knew he had the kind of killer evidence to easily prove the company had been calling him. When I received the calls from the two letters from them denying that they'd ever called me, 
that didn't upset me at all because I knew I had 100% solid cast iron proof there to play in court of my voice, their, my name, their company name, all in the same audio recording. So Richard took a few simple steps to start a small claims court case. It's ineffectual to keep kind of complaining at a company for month after month after month. It doesn't get anywhere. Obviously nothing's happening. Nobody's paying it attention. But the small claims court does make any any company, any trader, which is not which is of any size that they're not going to just run away, disappear, it does make them respond. And when the company received notice of the court claim and Richard informed them he had the voice recordings, they decided it was time to hang up on this argument. I had a letter apologising for what had happened and offering to pay the claim in full, so that was the £195 of my invoice and to refund the £25 of the court fee. I felt pleased not to be the victim, which is how I felt right at the beginning, but I felt that from this company they'd be careful not to call me again. And they never have. So it was a double victory for Richard. He got his peace and quiet from nuisance calls and he got paid. So what does he think the key ingredients of his success were? Recording the calls, what it was that we were agreeing to, they could call me at £10 a minute. I was clear definitively who they were, which I got from checking the phone call against their website and recording that in the conversation as well. Send an invoice with the covering letter, very business-like and formal, to send the recorded letter when it's ignored, and then to raise the case in the small claims court, all on the dates which I'd given them beforehand, so they could see that this was a relentless situation, that they wouldn't be stopped unless they took an action. Well, good on you, Richard. You're an inspiration to us all.